Andy Young is a film and TV editor with a specialty in comedy. He's worked on shows like Harley Quinn, Dressing Funny, music videos like Metallica's Crown of Barbed Wire, and his latest feature film, Merry Little Batman. It's my goal in this podcast to touch on topics I feel aren't talked about enough in the editing world, and hearing Andy's thoughts and experiences, I feel, will better the industry. Now, one thing that I do want to talk about, um, which it's funny because it seems taboo for a lot of people, is basically money. No, nah, man, I'm an open book. We should all be like very vocal about like how much money we make because it's we lose if we don't. I was one of three editors on a video called YouTube Rewind 2018, uh, <laughs> which uh, didn't do super well. So I would like take my parents to movies and make them like sit during the credits. And you see that thing of like, you know, it's like a seven minute thing of just names, 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 names. And I was like, see, like, this is the thing. What is the difference from this video, me earning a hundred dollars versus 750? Life's too short to not do the thing that you love to do, you know? When it comes to you, I know that, uh, well, like, first of all, you and I met at, at an Adobe event, which I was very happy about. Yes, we were both guests of Adobe Max uh, to be able to yeah give them some pointers on how to make the program even better. Exactly, which was great. And the thing that made me want to talk to you was because normally whenever I meet editors, um, it's either in the YouTube space because given that's where I'm mainly working, but then also what fascinated me about you was the fact that you do animation, like you just mentioned. And I think there's so much that a lot of us in the YouTube space can learn, especially when it comes to animation editors, because that's just a different medium. I would do want to start by asking you, like, how did you get into video editing and kind of what was your journey from your curiosity to want to edit till now? Yeah, I mean, I was always one of those kids, like, I can't imagine, or I can't really remember a time in my life where I wasn't, like, making something. Like, I was always, like, acting out scenes in movies with my brother, or taking pictures, or drawing comics, or playing instruments. Like, I was always one of those kids that always liked making things. And around middle school, we got, like, the family Dell computer, and it came with Windows Movie Maker on it. And the internet was still, not in its infancy, but it was still, there wasn't, like, YouTube wasn't a thing yet. But I was really into anime, and there's this website called, I think, amv.com. It was, like, anime music videos. And I was really into those, and I was like, I think I could make one of those. So I, like, downloaded episodes of Trigun, which was my favorite anime, and then I put it to, like, Linkin Park's In the End. It's the first thing I ever edited. It's still online. No, I will not share the link. Uh, but I loved doing that. It was like hours kind of went by like minutes. I loved like the creativity of it. So I went to film school and I kind of, I thought I was going to be a writer director, uh, but I kind of had this like epiphany in film school. Where I was like, I was always writing something. So I'd have something to direct, but then I was always directing. So I would have something to edit. Uh, so once I graduated film school and came out to LA, I was like, I'm going to chase the editing thing. I love like, it kind of uses both sides of your brain. It's the left side of being like, organized and meticulous and methodical, but it's the right side of being like sporadic and creative and kind of trying anything. You know, one thing that's that's funny is because I feel like a lot of us, we always start out of an interest in making our own stuff. And then you kind of realize like, oh, this is what I want to do. But I also know that a lot of times, at least for me, um, growing up, uh, my parents never fully understood what it is that I was trying to do with editing. Uh, do you feel like your family or your parents ever dealt with that too? Or how did you navigate that? No, my parents were weirdly really cool about it. Like I, so initially my dream was even more uh, unobtainable. I wanted to be a musician. I, I spent four years of high school training myself to be in the Berklee College of Music. And the thing is, I got like a really, even with like creative stuff, I always got like my parents' work ethic, both of them, which was very like, I would wake up at five in the morning, play guitar for two hours, go to school, come back, play guitar for another five hours. And that was just my regimen every day. Uh, and then I kind of approached uh, filmmaking the same way once I got into it. It was like very like every day I would wake up two hours early, try to teach myself a new skill, make things kind of fun and silly for my friends, but then also trying to like figure out all the different types of filmmakers. So I think my parents were always very, I feel very lucky, honestly, because a lot of my friends who were into art in high school kind of got talked into doing other careers. And my parents were all, they kind of saw the path before I did that like, uh, my dad especially was always like, you're going to somehow make money doing this. I'm not sure how, but you're you're working too hard not to. So I feel very lucky in that regard uh, that they were uh, incredibly supportive. And, you know, so is my brother and my, my nanny. Everyone in my family has always been like really. And it's kind of been cool to see the dividends of that pay off. Like, you know, my movie just like premiered. So they were in town and they got to see a big billboard of a 
you know, giant Batman movie their son made, you know, 30 years after they saw their son dressing up as Batman, acting out scenes from the animated series. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's very full circle, but no, I, I always give a lot of props. I, I worked really hard, but I got very lucky of how supportive my parents were of, of my dream. I got into editing when I was 14, but it was like full on at 15. And from 15 to like 20, I think it was like 22, was when I was trying to like keep it as a hobby. I didn't know exactly what I could do with it. And then later on, that's when kind of like the career started, like little by little. But my parents were, you know, none of us come from anything besides, I guess you can say traditional jobs. So they were just kind of like, I know you're working hard for something. We don't know what that is, but we have faith in you. And awesome. I, th I think that's the thing that like, some people need to hear is like, maybe not everyone will understand or some people will have supportive parents, but you can always make something even if like, you kind of feel like there's a lot of doubt in it. Yeah, like I, it's funny you say that because my wife is Latina and we met in film school and she's not in the film industry anymore, but I remember going to her mom's place one day and her mom being like, so how are you going to make money doing this? And she was saying that to my girlfriend, now wife, her daughter, but I, I always kind of internalized for that for myself because I was early on, like, I want to marry this chick. But I was like, I got to make sure she knows that I can make money doing this and something that helped me because I always had despite you know how incredibly supportive my parents were I always had this chip up my shoulder of like I gotta prove that this is a job that I can do so I would like take my parents to movies and make them like sit during the credits and you see that thing of like you know it's like a seven minute thing of just names 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 and then a lot of times at the end it's the thing of like this created 10,000 jobs or whatever and I was like see yeah. like this is the thing <laughs> and I, I always try to because again I know that I come from a very privileged place of my parents being cool with it, a lot of people weren't, but that's why I do interviews like this because I like to show that it is a tangible job. It's a nine to five. It's something that like, if you work hard and you find a community, you can like make this a living. Life's too short to not do the thing that you love to do, you know? There's even more ways to make money as an editor than there were before when I started. So it's, uh, I know, I, I totally get that, but that's always when I'm in, uh, mentoring kids, I'm like, Put your parents on the horn, man. I'll talk to them. I'll, I'll show them my like stub from Warner Brothers and be like, they could make this, you know? It's not right. doctor money, but it's better than what I would have made as a musician, you know? No, and you know what? Before we even get into money, because I, I would love to talk on that topic. When you first started then, and then, you know, you kind of worked your way to where you are now. I would love to know what was kind of your, traje your trajectory from like kind of not having connections, not knowing what to do. And then how did you find your way into, let's say, your first job? Yeah, that's a great question. So I got really lucky. Uh, well, I don't know about lucky. I worked really hard. But like I made a my last film in college, I made a thesis film called uh, Keith and Heath, which was like a puppet comedy musical that I'd always had in my head. Uh, some parts don't hold up, but overall, I'm still really proud of it. But that ended up uh, I lived in Austin and that uh, some people at Rooster Teeth saw that. And then that was kind of how I got my foot in the door there. Like I was an intern at a company in Austin, but I never really did like the assistant editor to editor track like most people do. I was always like, like most of my friends uh, that I met in LA, what they do is like, they went from post BA to assistant editor to editor on big shows. And I was doing just editing, but on really small stuff. And I would say by 2018, I was working very steadily, making a really good rate. Uh, but those first two years, it was a lot of like, still getting jobs from Austin or cutting like weddings and, you know, corporate videos, lawyer ads. But around 2018, I, I caught the eye of uh, a company called Sawhorse out here, which was doing a lot of like branded stuff and comedy stuff. And that kind of started really paying my bills heavily. And I became kind of an in-demand uh, branded editor. And like, I would say, like a YouTube editor, I would say, like I was editing for a lot of big like YouTube stars and branded spots, the pinnacle of which was, and this is where uh, all your viewers leave, I was one of three editors on a video called YouTube Rewind 2018, yeah. uh, which uh, oh, okay. yeah. didn't do super well. Yeah. I haven't say anything about it, but uh, <laughs> but the important thing about YouTube, that uh, the reason I always bring it up is because that was kind of my er moment of like, I moved to LA to do film and television, but the path to YouTube editing was like, it was there, it was present. If you had enough like credits online, like you could kind of get in at all these companies. And I was making honestly more than I make at Warner Brothers. I was making really good money, but I kind of had that er moment after Rewind Bomb where I was like, I didn't come here to make YouTube stuff. I came here to make movies. So I started like t actively turning down jobs and just trying to get film, television, anything. But I wanted to like say all that stuff because that kind of led into how I got Harley because from there, like there was a weird t thing during COVID where 
a lot of all the animation was like ramping up and all the animation editors were booked. So they started looking for live action editors with comedy experience, which I had from all of my YouTube stuff. From a lot of these like kind of bigger YouTubers I had worked for, I had done a lot of pre viz work and storyboard editing and things that actively work into animation. So I was able to kind of parlay some of that like internet experience to be able to showcase like, I know how After Effects works. I know how like the boarding process works. I know what an XML is. And from, I think like that stuff weirdly helped out. In fact, even like the AMV, like the anime music video stuff I did back when I was a kid, like that really prepared me for animation editing more than I expected. No, yeah, it does. And, you know, given that I, for a while, have been trying to get into just little by little into doing more of like anything that's TV or something related, right? Yeah. But I know that a lot of times I, I do feel like I am like gate kept out of it. Because I don't already either have credits or I believe I don't have, um, you can talk more on this too, which is more like, I think it's like hours to meet a threshold or something. Yep. It's, right? I think what you're referring to is it's called the roster. So basically there's non-union work and there's union work, right? And for union work, you need to be on something called the industry experience roster. And to get on that is very difficult, especially if you're someone like us who got all their credits for YouTube because they don't count it. It's really weird. Like when I was doing it in 2019, they said the only credits they would accept that weren't broadcast or theatrical were if your show was on Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, or the Roku channel. Um, oh, so it's very okay. like archaic, even like I had a show on YouTube red and that didn't count, you know, even these things with like big budgets rewind, obviously oh, no didn't kidding. count. Yeah. It's like anything with new media, they would like take off. In fact, I kind of got grandfathered in because one of my credits, I had worked at college humor and there was a show dropout had just become a thing and i cut the first season of uh, the show they had called them actually and when i submitted it they tried to be like these hours don't count this is a college humor thing i was like no no it is a 20 minute television show that is on the roku channel which you said counted so it's like i it's really hard to get onto it my advice is to if you live in la go to the contract services building which is in burbank they're very nice it, it can feel like the dmv times a million because we're all like artists that just want to make stuff but they want you to get in. It, it is kind of an archaic system, but if you are kind and patient with them, they will be helpful with you. But collecting your hours can be difficult because it's like what they consider an like considered hours. The parameters are very, uh, in my opinion, archaic for sure. So do you think then going to that place, for example, someone like me who's been doing YouTube since I was 15, that's probably my best bet for now? I would say my big advice is to... Try to work on stuff that is going to have some sort of chance of getting distribution on something they consider, you know, um, like a bigger web series. Uh, stuff for, oh, I forget what it was called, like VRV. I think they might have counted some of my stuff on that. I don't know if that's still a thing anymore. But I would look into all of your credits and then just see what counts. One way that a friend of mine got in, who I'll, I won't say the name of the show and stuff, but like he had cut on a show for a giant, giant, giant internet company that got spun off into like a Hulu show. And then like he was able to say like because his Hulu credits were there, but then he kind of counted all of his hours that were at the internet company in general, just being like, well, I worked on this Hulu show. Here's like a year's worth of hours. And then they were like, we're not going to read all these. Just you're in, you know, I don't know how much trouble I'm getting in my, myself with these, but I try to help people with this kind of thing because it is like no one really helped. Well, no, that's not true. Neil Mahoney, rest in peace, was like a huge help of me figuring it out. But at the point being, like it was, I had to go to other editors to kind of figure out how that process worked. Basically then it sounded like your trajectory kind of went from you, you went, you studied, you got some jobs on the online space that mm -hmm. led you to where you are now. Now, one thing that I do want to talk about, um, which it's funny because it seems taboo for a lot of people is basically money. No, man, I'm an open book. My wife and I, oh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. I was just going to like, I really like to get on my high horse about this because my wife and I are big proponents of like, we should all be like very vocal about like how much money we make because it's, we lose if we don't, you know, if we're like saying, I don't know, because this would happen to me at the start of my career where it's like, I didn't know how much an editor made. So I ended up getting screwed over a lot because I, I was like, oh, gee whiz, I don't know. Uh, what's a good rate? And they were like, well, McDonald's people make this much. So how about you make just barely above that? And I was like, oh, shucks, great. There's two w great ways I want to just project out there to find out if you're trying to find out your rate. The big one is Blue Collar Boast Collective. It's a great Facebook group. They do meetings uh, out in LA and elsewhere. You should totally join. They do a wage survey every year and uh, lots of editors from amateur to aspiring to professional contribute to it. So you can see like based on where someone lives or what their job is, 
what their day rate is, what their weekly rate is, how much they make in overtime, et cetera. I submit to it every year. Most of my friends do as well. And that's a really good barometer based on where you live or what job you're doing to be able to see like if you're making a good rate or not. In the YouTube space and like there's there's websites that like they will post job postings, um, which is called the uh, YT jobs and people will post jobs for whatever it is they need for their YouTube channel, right? But the problem that I have is most of the time that the pay gap is so, it's so big where I'm like, what is the difference from this video, me earning a hundred dollars minimum you're saying versus 750? Like, is this gonna be like a time thing, hourly thing? Are you trying to charge me for the project? Like it gets so in the weeds and annoying. Yeah, when I got started, that was the other thing I learned very early on, like, don't take flat rates. Like, it's, I would edit kind of the same way I would edit, like, per video. And then it's, again, they were able to, like, dip in all these charges of, like, oh, well, you're also going to be coloring it and mixing it and, you know, doing all of the, these delivery things for it. And, uh, you know, we'll get, like, as many cuts as we want. There's not a timetable on it. So uh, that can be very tricky. And it's it's difficult because I know that that's a lot of how the YouTube space works unfortunately at least it was when i was there of like they would like try to charge you per video or what have you and that's asinine you know because you can't gauge how much something like that's going to be so i always like uh early on i was like i will only do like a day rate or a weekly rate but i will not do the worst one i did was like i did a uh thing that was like three months and i didn't get paid for three months until the show was finished and i got like a good chunk for it but it wasn't for like three months later so i had to like start you know, doing other like uh, odd jobs and stuff outside of editing to be able to like pay my bills for like a little while, which uh, was difficult. And I know that a lot of it does depend, like people will say like, well, I'm going to pay this much if it's a beginner, this much if it's a, a medium intermediary, like editor and then an expert. The The problem I have though, is like, uh, this would be actually be good because for you, um, since you've already dealt with this before, like a lot of the issues that I know a lot of people run into that I try to find an answer for is when they do say, oh, I'm going to charge this person hourly. I have personally been bitten so many times in the butt where people will say that should not have taken you X amount of hours. I'm only going to give you half of that. And I'm like, we didn't agree to that though. And that's also BS. You can't just change the price. No, that's, that's, that's uh snickery. That's uh, exactly that, sh that should not be allowed. And it's tricky to gauge like skill level and stuff like that as well because everybody wants a quote-unquote rock star editor but what they actually want is someone who's cheap and will do all of the like coloring and mixing and all the extra stuff for it i don't have an answer for that that's just a shitty um ugh, i don't have an answer for whoever that uh, screw that person who tried to do that kind of thing oh dude that has happened more often than you would think and usually what i just try to tell people is like look if you're gonna do hourly you have to get it in some form of like written agreement Something that you can refer to. So if you have to pursue things legally, I guess you can, even though it sucks that sometimes you have to get to that. Always get, always get in in writing. Some friend of mine had given me like some very basic like contracts that were just like, I will provide this service for this thing at this rate uh, with this thing in mind. And then it's at least I have, I, and luckily I never had to get litigious in my career, but it's like, if I had to, I, I for every single project I've done, I have that like piece of paper that is like, we agreed it would be this thing. And thankfully, once you get to a higher level, it gets a lot easier to be able to like do that kind of stuff because they always need you signing like NDAs and, you know, deal memos and stuff like that. You know what? Let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to open up myself with the whole money thing. I would love it if you can as well. Here's where I'm at now. So for anyone listening that doesn't know me. So right now my full-time job is I work with Thomas Frank. We, we work on both of his channels. We have the Thomas Frank channel and the Thomas Frank explains channel. For Thomas, I am a full-time video editor, but it's not just that. If you see the set behind us, I will help with set design, with lighting. I, I set up everything if Tom cannot do it. So I'm basically there to kind of be kind of like a creative assistant, a second to him to help him with whatever he needs. And then I also take client work on the side whenever I feel like I want a little extra money to pay off some debt, right? So I will say right now, because it's not, it's not like a private thing, I currently make with Tom $120,000 a year. So I make $10,000 every single month through that source of income. Whenever I take side jobs, it always depends on who I'm working with, how much work I need to do for them. And then it also depends, like what you're saying, am I editing? Am I going to do motion graphics? Am I supposed to do the coloring and all this? And the thing is, I know a lot of new beginners will think that maybe us professionals get too much in the weeds. Like, why do I have to charge for every little thing? I can just do that already. And it's because you have to understand the value you're providing to your client. Yes. 
you need to know your worth. You need to charge for each. And I'm really happy to hear you say it because it's like you need to know like what your worth is for each of these individual tasks. Like I, towards the end of my YouTube days, I got to a place where I was like, I'll edit for this price, but for this price, I will color and mix. Warning, I'm not a colorist or mixer. You should just hire someone else anyways, you know. And it probably did cost me from getting jobs, but then I got more jobs that were uh, fair and like understood what my needs were, you know. So that's really good to hear you say that, Tony, because that's exactly the mindset you should have uh, when it comes to this. You need to know what your worth is and you won't be making six figures when you start out. At least I didn't. But again, you're not too far from what I make. So that's you're you're definitely on the you know, it's a good tra 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 trajectory to show that you can do this for a living. You still just won't be able to speak very well. No, but go ahead. Now I open this up to you, whatever you can, whatever you feel like sharing. No, yes. Yeah, so let me see. When I first moved out to LA, I didn't know better. I think at Research, I was probably making like 250 or 300 a day, which isn't terrible. But it, uh, and then like at some certain companies out here uh, that don't exist anymore, if I could call it humor, like I was making like even less uh, for doing some of that stuff. I've heard they're better now for what it's worth. So, but generally, once I got out here and I got a little more established, my day rate was about like 400 a day. Uh, when I was starting at like a pl places that were around here, like Sawhorse or whatever. And I was able to slowly start bumping it up once I get got more familiar with the creators or uh, more able to say like, hey, I know like I can do this faster than these people and my day rate's going to be a little higher by comparison. But in the long run, you'll be in, you'll end up paying less uh, than you would somebody who's going to take longer to do this. And that was kind of my arguments. So I got to bump up uh, to 400 to 450 to 500. When I was a branded editor at Netflix, I think I was making like 600 a day. Just really quick. So for those that have never heard of a day rate, what is that? A day rate, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's how much money you're paid uh, by the day. Again, like I've been paid, I don't really, I haven't been paid by the hour that much unless you include like dividing your pay, uh, your day rate by eight or 10 or 12 or whatever. Again, make sure you set like how many hours you're working because early in my career, I would assume it would be an eight hour day. And they were like, great, come on in for 12 hour days. And not only is that obviously longer time, but you're splitting your day rate in, by 12 instead of eight. So you're making less money than you had budgeted for. Um, a day rate is just how much you make in a day. Warner Brothers, I get paid weekly, but again, like you can like split it into the thing. So I don't know. I don't have my sheet for when I started on Harley Quinn. But I can say that, like, currently I am making, where I just had it, uh, I am making about $511 a day at Warner Brothers if you split my weekly rate in half, uh, or weekly rate in five, and that's b uh, before taxes. So I think last year I made about, like, 100 grand. Um, and I don't, haven't taken a lot of side work as, as, when I was freelance and non union side hustles like crazy. I, there were times where I was doing like five projects at once. Now it's like Warner Brothers takes so much of my time up and I'm trying to be a good husband, trying to be like available and uh, around with my wife. So I'm not as like taking a lot of jobs heavy. That said, it's like I do a lot of work for my favorite band, Motion City Soundtrack, or I'll do the odd like short or music video for fun. Um, or, you know, like I got to do a music video for Metallica that I was doing on the side. But mostly it's like I just work a five, nine to five just at Warner. And that's paying my bills that's my net so it's like i'm making i think it's it ends up being like 2500 before taxes and then probably like 1500 or 16 1700 after taxes i'm not sure off the top of my head but yeah i would say like before taxes i make about 100 grand uh a year or something like that but before that i think i when i first moved out here i was making like 30 grand a year and then it was like 50 and then 70 and then like now i'm making yeah that's what i was about to ask how did you progress your payment and your scaling because I'll, I'll talk about that as well yeah i'd love to hear how you did because for me it was just kind of it was exactly why i'm doing this thing where my friends are probably watching this like why are you saying this stuff it's like this is why i knew to be able to like charge more because i would talk to my friends in the industry who were doing similar jobs that I was, some even at the same companies I was at, and they would be making more than me, or sometimes they would be making less than me. And that's why I always kind of took this attitude of being like uh, embarrassingly transparent of how much money I make, because I know that I have like friends who make way more than I do, but I also know there's some friends who probably do the same job and make way less. So I, I think it's important to be transparent about how much we make so that none of us are getting screwed over, especially because when I was starting out, there wasn't anyone around to tell me like, hey, this is how much I charge for editing. This is how much I charge for color. This is how much I charge for sound. I was just kind of like, well, I did this all for free in film school. I guess I'll do it for slightly more. And it's like, that's that's not an option anymore. I got bills to pay. I got car, car payments, you know? Uh, those trips to the movies don't pay for themselves. I also really do appreciate you saying that because your attitude in terms of being transparent is what I've always wanted 
someone to be with me since I started. Because most of the time people didn't want to talk about it or they're like, oh no, if I say this, then like my buddy's going to know and he's making a lot less. I'm like, dude, if you know this, you should be supporting each other on this. You would be helping your buddy or your buddy would be helping you. Exactly. I can't tell you how many times in my career, like I... And it's like, again, most times I'll try to bring it up and people are like, I'm not going to, it's like someone asks like what their favorite, you're asking someone your, their favorite sex position is. They're like, oh, whoa, I barely know you. But it's like, <laughs> to me, it's like, this is how we find out right. if we're being paid fairly or not. So I don't know. I've, uh, and it's like, if people are like offended by it or whatever, then it's like, they're probably not the kind of person that would pay you fairly. Yep. That's what I was going to say. At the end of the day, I, I want to be as useful with these conversations to anyone that's new or even people that are professionals and they're still thinking like, no, this guy pays me five grand a month. I feel like that's worth it. And I'm like, dude, you should be making double that at this point. Yeah, exactly. That's like, because then you break that down. It's like, that's a thousand a week. That's 200 a day. And it's not a terrible rate. Again, we're all blessed to do what we should, we make doctors and, or teachers should make way more than us doctors already do. But the idea is like, we should still know like what our worth is, you know? And again, that's why I highly recommend looking up at Blue Collar Post Collective. They do a wage survey every year. You can go back and see previous years Excel sheets. Look up what your job is, look up what area you live in, and then you can kind of start to get an idea of like, based on, ex and you can see it, people put how like how long they've been working in the industry too. So you can then kind of quantify based on everyone's like experience, where they live and what they're doing, what generally a rate should be. Because the, here's the other thing, I hate talking about money. I can't stand it. I wish I had an agent strictly so that I could have somebody do all those conversations for me. Because I'm a really nice guy. So it's like a lot of times for like smaller stuff, I'll be like, Oh, I'll just do it for free, whatever. It's fine. But it's like, I don't know. I, I know I, it's so funny because it's like for how like much I think and talk about and, and transparent about money, I hate having that conversation when I'm like up for a job or something. It's like I would much rather have like an agent like do that stuff for me. And then I can, I just want to talk about movies and making movies. That's the part of the process I like. Yeah. It's all this other stuff you that's like- want to show up and get ready for work. Yeah, it's all this other stuff that's like uncomfortable and iffy. It's like, I'd rather just have like some like guy just be like, he makes this much money. And then I'm like, yeah, like, come on guys, let's make a movie. Like that's the part I want to talk about. Yeah, let, let's start with this. We have a brand new person who's into editing or let's say someone who's edited just for one year. Like that's a good start, I'd say. If they start, let's say, because they need work, $50 a video- how would then they slowly get more pay? How do you think they should manage or uh, navigate that? I would say if you're just starting out, look at every type of editing you can do as maybe not experience that's going to get you the type of job you want, but it's going to be experience that will make you a better editor. Like when I was doing wedding stuff and commercial stuff and lawyer stuff that made me want to blow my brains out, I would kind of look at a thing of like, okay, this has really big, bad sound. I'm going to use this as an exercise to figure out how I can fix this or how can I make these two shots that are totally different color match or how can I try out this like skill? So it's like, it's, it's really important when you're starting out, you're going to do a lot of like shitty, boring things that are not the dream job, but you have to look at each of these as like a learning exercise. It's not going to be on your resume later, but it's like all of the skills I learned doing my shitty jobs absolutely went into when I was doing my giant Batman movie. So there is something to doing like the free creative stuff. But then when it comes to like money branded stuff, like don't cut a Coca-Cola spot for free. You know what I mean? It's like, there's, do your money jobs for money, do your creative jobs for creative. And the goal is to make those two Venn diagrams become the same circle so that your creative job and your money job is the same. Yeah. Ooh, that was, that's beautiful. Funny enough, the next thing I did want to talk about was networking and community. Uh, right before we get into that, I do want to just state this. So again, uh, for anyone that doesn't know uh, kind of my path, which by the way, there is a video on my channel for anyone that's interested. I do have a video where I talked about basically how I started my whole journey through editing. Um, but the way this worked out for me was I first started by doing kind of like what you said, I would do free stuff. Eventually I had really small gigs where like this one YouTuber was only going to pay me like $20 a video. But again, I was like, well, I need something. I'll just do that. Uh, and then it wasn't until I did that to where somebody was paying me $80 a week where I realized this sucks. Why am I accepting this? So I started thinking like, okay, hold on. What if I broke it up then instead of that to a project? So that way I can charge more, but at least some of that extra time I wasn't getting paid kind of got covered, if that makes sense. So it's like, okay, how about instead of $80 a week, I did 200. And then I'm like, dude, I'll do whatever you need for those $200 a week. I could be done in like a day and I get to just do other stuff in the other time. And then from there, that's when I started, uh, that's when I met Tom. Coincidentally, so Tom and I started at $350 a video um, and that just quickly increased. Um, we went from there to a retainer 
of I think it was four thousand three hundred dollars a month. But again, the, the the gist was I'm his full time editor now, and at least at the time that was enough to pay what I needed. So I was kind of like, okay, I'm not making huge money, but I'm making great money to start. But now, like you said, what's the trick now that I can kind of make sure that this can progressively scale? Because I also don't at the time because I didn't know Tom as well yet. I was like, I don't want to make sure like we don't get stuck there forever. So I started learning more. I told Tom, whatever you want me to learn, man, I'm going to be there with you. More marketable skills. Absolutely. Exactly. And then now that is how it led to me making over a hundred grand with him. But, But that's because I bring so much for him every day. And that's what I want people to know is the more you bring in for jobs, the more you should factor that in. Uh, if I can ask a follow up. So like, did you like, like take some time, like to start learning like After Effects and Photoshop and things like that. So you would be able to be kind of a one. Exactly. That's really smart. Cause that is something that I did like as a YouTube editor, because it's like, I didn't want to be a mixer or colorist, but I found now that I still use all of those things. Like I'm obviously not the mixer or whatever on something like Batman, but all of the cuts that I turn in have a really solid dialogue sound mix. So we're not getting notes on that shit. So it's like all of that stuff really does help. And that's really interesting to hear like, so were you able, when you were starting to like do all these jobs, were you like kind of compartmentalizing in my head? Like this will take this many hours. So I should charge like this much. Or did you still have kind of like a general yeah, parameter? Yeah. Okay. No, it was, yeah. I was trying to make sure I broke it down to my estimated time. Um, but at the same time, I had to make sure I'm factoring in like, uh, like let's put it this way. If when I first started, I would take a lot longer than I do now to make a video. Right. So that is partly why I felt a lot of people were like, well, it shouldn't take you this long and I'm going to just net like take away $40 and whatever. So then now that I gotten so much better, I'm like, you don't need to worry how long I'll take. I will get this done and this is how much I'm charging. So then that way it's never a back and forth on time. It's a back and forth on did I, did I do the task or not? And do you factor in like how many like cuts that you're, you're going to turn in and stuff like that? Like, like I've started like doing, or yep. again, this isn't like Warner Brothers, like, like freelance stuff. I will like say like, I will do, especially if it's a lower budget thing, I will put in like a max of like three or four cuts. Cause if I'm doing something for really cheap. I'm not going to like do something ad nauseum because that's how they can really get you. So it is like, again, like you want to be able to say a thing of just like, I want to make sure that you, the client are getting what you want. That's what it comes down to, whether it's like you doing YouTube stuff or me doing Warner Brothers stuff. It's like you, like someone is like, has this big stack of money and they're like, okay, I need to make this thing, this sack of money turn into this thing. Who can I trust that is going to get that sack of money to turn into this thing? And you want to give them all of the confidence that you can, you know? So having all of those marketable skills is like a great way to showcase that. See, and that, and that's the, that's the next thing about networking com- community, which actually this could be a good way to follow this up. Um, Cause what I wanted to talk about with networking and such is like, I know some people don't like the idea of networking. They feel like it's to meet someone to gain something from them, which don't get me wrong to some degree. I, I get it. Cause that's kind of how a lot of people find their work, but you should also think of it as like, we're living in, in a time where in the creative space, you can be friends with almost anyone now and you can reach out to people on Twitter. Like you can just message someone who's a director. You guys can have like one thing in common that you both like Spider-Man. And then look, you just made a genuine friend who happens to be a director. I'm not saying you can ask him for a job right away, but now you know you made like a little bridge to someone that one day, if you really are down, you can ask them or you can offer them something in return. But the thing is, it's just friends like to work with friends. So like, to me, it's a no brainer. And friends like to recommend friends for other jobs. That's exactly like how I would put it as well. Like I, I'm actually like a very like shy introverted person. So it's like when I first started, when I first moved to LA and I didn't know anybody, I kind of had two ways of networking. One is I would go to any type of editing events, like in LA, they have like Black Pug or Blue Collar Post Collective, whatever. I would go to these things and I would kind of challenge myself of like, okay, I'm going to talk to two people that I've never met before. And then like the next time I would go, I was like, okay, I'm going to talk to three people. I'm going to talk to five people. And then it was like, I would start to see the same people and then like have connections and friends, people that would eventually be invited to my wedding. But the thing that I always approach it with, I like you that you said the word genuine friendship, because that is actually like, it can feel really like shitty to be networking. Cause I've been on both sides of it where I've been really desperate trying to get a job or when people have come to me and been really desperate to get at the job. And either way, it always feels really slimy. You know, but the thing that really worked for me is like coming at it from a place of like, I'm looking for people I want to go to watch a movie with or like to have over to my apartment or whatever. The other way that I would do it is kind of similar to what you said of like, I would just like look up my favorite TV shows, movies, whatever, 
I would find who the editor was in the credits. I would like Google them. They usually have websites. Editors love having websites. And I would just cold email them. Like that's how like a big mentor of mine, Neil Mahoney, uh, who's sadly no longer with us. I just, I was a huge fan of everything that he edited. And I just like cold emailed him. And I was like, hey man, can I like buy you coffee and ask you a million questions? And then he did. A lot of editors did that for me. The worst I ever got is someone was like, I'm too busy, but email me any question you have and I'm going to help you with it. For as like dog eat dog as the film industry is, I think there is like this beautiful thing in the post-production community where we all want to see each other working. We all want to help our friends get jobs. And I've always tried to be that kind of mentor of like, if a friend of mine isn't working, I'm putting them up for stuff as much as I can because they've done the same for me. And in reality, that's exactly how I'm able to sit down and talk to you. Because when we were at that Adobe event and we were in that room and we were all talking and I heard your name and I heard animation editor, my ears lit up. And you just, you made a beeline to me during lunch. And I knew I was like, he's coming to me network and that's chill. Like, cause I did the same thing a million times. Like the last Adobe thing I went at uh, to Adam Epstein was there. He's the editor of like the bear and SNL and stuff. And I just like kept making a beeline to him, kept picking his brain. He's super nice. Like he would tell me all this stuff. That's what those events are for is to meet other editors that are like at a different level than you, that you want to learn from. And honestly, like I've learned a ton from you too, for this conversation. So it's really nice to be able to like, meet people who are in different facets of the industry and like to pick their brains and stuff. So it's like any like editing podcast you guys are fans of or any like uh, whatever it is, uh, influencer editor, it's like they're doing this because they want to help. And it's like when people reach out to me directly, that's usually a sign of like, oh, this person wants it. You know, I, I used to have a thing where it's like sometimes because I'm like you, I don't have any family in the industry. I didn't know anybody in the industry going starting out, but like everyone's got like a nephew or a friend's cousin or whatever that like wants to make it in movies. So it's like, you know, a couple times a month, people will email me of like, this is this person. And it's like, I can weed them out pretty quickly just from an email of like, do you just like watching movies? Or are you like your bone marrow is going to disintegrate if you don't do this for a living? And it's like, I'll always like make time for the latter. You know, you can't fake that stuff. Even for people that are new and starting in or those that wonder like, is this for me? Should I pursue this? Like, take it from me, I swear, like I have no one that was able to help me in any of the steps that I had to take to get to where I'm at. So I had to think in every possible way, what can I do for myself to put me literally where I'm sitting at now? This was what I've wanted for so long. So I would say, yeah, for anyone that's like nervous about approaching someone or sending a cold email, I just want to make it a point to say like, make it very genuine. Please don't copy and paste the same email to everyone, really specify it for that person. But then lastly, come at it with a sense of respect. Uh, the last thing I'll say, they'll say too is like, so um, there's a guy who's a movie editor at Disney who I consider a nice mentor and a friend. His name is Jeff Draham. So he's worked on Moana, Frozen, Frozen 2. Like he had no business responding to my email when I cold emailed him about advice on like how to be an editor, how to eventually become an animation editor. And we became friends through that. I met him and we had lunch at Burbank. And it's because I didn't approach it as give me something. It's I'm coming at it as I'm I'm looking to you for advice. Yeah. And if they're a good mentor, like, again, like I, I had this mentor named Neil Mahoney. Again, sadly passed away. But he was always incredible about, like, without me even asking, I, he saw, like, something. I'm not the only editor. There were a ton of editors he did this for. But, like, he would just like put us up for stuff he couldn't do. You know, he would say really nice stuff if he saw something we made. And it's like, I've had a couple mentors like that, but Neil sticks to me because I never properly got to say thank you. And that's probably why I do so much of this is just like, I want to keep that like engine of, uh, of uh, uh, mentorship running, you know? And it's always like, I'm really uh, like a magnet. I'm really attracted to other people that feel the same way about like fostering and building community. So it's like anytime I see someone who had that like piss and vinegar that I had starting out feeling like I'll do anything to work in this. And it's like, I will do anything I can to try to get through there. It's not a guarantee you're going to get there. Getting the foot in the door can only, as you know, get you so far. But more often than not in this industry, like if you are kind and you are responsible and organized and reliable, it's really hard to not make it to some degree. You might not be like become an Oscar winner, but it's like, if you are like good at like these things, it's like word of mouth spreads quick on who's great and reliable and who's shitty and not fun to have in an edit bay, you know? And it's like, if you're the former, it's like you can raise up like pretty quickly, honestly. At the end of all this, I think like you've, you've shared so much valuable stuff, both for myself and hopefully for those listening. And, 
you know, the last thing I want to do is just help you with anything. So, like, is there anything you'd like to promote, talk about? Where, where can we find you? Yeah, I'm on all of the things uh, at Andy Young Film. Letterboxd is my favorite social media, so by all means, follow me there uh, if you want to follow me anywhere. Um, I'm a uh, Harley Quinn is on well, Max, and I believe uh, Mary Little Batman is on Amazon Prime. So uh, check it out. I'm super pr- uh, proud of it. It's my favorite thing I've ever worked on, and uh, I'm hoping uh, you'll dig it. 